Good afternoon, everyone. You made such a good decision coming here today. This is one of our favorite weeks of the year, and you're about to find out why. Professor James Waller is the Cohen Chair of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State University in New Hampshire. It's the only university in the country that has an undergraduate major in Holocaust Studies. He has held fellowships with the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C., and he continues to serve as the Academic Programs Director at the Auschwitz Institute for Peace and Reconciliation. Dr. Waller grew up in Atlanta at the height of the civil rights struggle, and very early on, he had plenty of cause to question the social divisions and the racism in the society around him. His graduate work at the University of Kentucky and his first books were on the topics of racism and prejudice in America. Before moving to Keene, Dr. Waller was a professor of social psychology at Whitworth University in Spokane. Professor Waller has been a highlight of this lecture series for many years. His study of becoming evil is a critical analysis for this course and a third edition of this classic text, but now entitled Confronting Evil. So, Jim, is this a new book or it's a, a new, oh, okay, never mind. First edition of Confronting Evil should be hot off the Oxford University Presses anytime, so you can pick that up. His depiction of the insidious cycle of genocide demands our attention and alerts us to how a seemingly inconsequential series of events can snowball into genocide. At the heart of his study is the most essential question of this semester. How do we become evil? Now, periodically, some infidel will come up to me and say, you know, that this Waller fellow, he's on your lineup every semester, every year. Why do you keep getting the same people? And the obvious answer to that is, when you find the best, you bring them back. So please join me in welcoming Professor James Waller. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That's very nice, Diane. It's also, I'm an easy yes. I mean, I think that's part of it too, is I'm just very little, low effort to bring me here. But this is about, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 times I've been here. Always a great time to be with you. Uh, I'm coming from Keene, New Hampshire, where yesterday we had five inches of snow, and today's high is 22 or some ridiculous thing. But actually, that's, it's been mild. That's a mild time for us. It's nothing at all like this whatsoever. So I've been sending emails back to my students at Keene about every hour I'll send them an email updating them on the temperature and the <laughs> pictures and different things I see. So it is always great to be with you but especially uh, so certainly today. Uh, there are, I'm looking at all the people, oh, this is good, we're kind of spread out. A lot of, there's only one seat left open in back, so if there's anybody sitting in front that wants to move to the back, I think we have a couple of seats here in the corners. But we are gonna talk today, as I said, about I think one of the pressing questions that we face in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, which is how do people come, how do people uh, come to the point where they can commit the types of atrocities that you've been reading about over the course of the semester. To look at that, the questions we're asking are really questions of individual agency, the range of human behaviors. As I mentioned in the introduction, I'm by training a social psychologist, which means I study how people relate with other people, but for whatever reason I've spent my career studying how people misrelate with other people. So the early part of my career, issues of race in America. The past 20, 25 years, issues of the extreme form of human misrelation, of what happens when we say to a group of people, it's not just that you can't have the right to vote, that you can't have the right to live in this neighborhood, that you can't have the right to have this job or to have this opportunity, but we say to people, you can't have the right to be, period. When we get to that point that we've said to a people based simply on their group identity, you no longer have a right 
to be. You no longer have a right to exist. At that point, we've crossed the line into genocide. For genocide to happen, humans are involved in it. Genocide happens because individual human beings like you and I choose to commit, uh, choose to kill other human beings in large numbers and over an extended period of time. So when we look at the players in the tragedy of genocide, they're us. There are people like you and I who make decisions to be bystanders, by and large. This is the most common decision we make. It's great that you're studying this class and this lecture series. As Diane mentioned, at Keene State, we have the only undergraduate major in Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the U.S., but I have the great opportunity and privilege to speak at a lot of colleges and universities across the country, but there's no series like what you have here. Every semester at Keene State, we bring one speaker to campus. In the, in the fall, it's on the Holocaust. In the spring, it's on some other case of genocide. Those are our two main events. You have like 15 or 16 of these every spring semester, so it's really an incredibly unique program. You recognize more than most people that you live and you work and you have relationships today in a world where we have countries still in town and tearing themselves apart, whether it's Syria, Iraq, Central African Republic, Burundi, Burma, um, uh, Sudan, South Sudan. You live in a world in which countries are still tearing themselves apart and most of the world is simply content to sit by and say, not my problem, someone else's problem. So probably the biggest actor when we talk about individual agency and genocide are bystanders. We do have beautiful cases of people who choose to stand up, to resist, to rescue. Myrna Goodman, from, uh, some of you have Myrna as instructor, has built her academic career on studying the people who choose to resist, who choose to rescue. We have cases of people choosing not to simply stand by, but to stand up to become upstanders in the face of these atrocities. Certainly we have the victims and survivors of the atrocities, but today what we want to focus on are the perpetrators, the men and women who commit these atrocities, the men and women who carry out the violence, the killing, the extermination, the rape, the sexual violence that is at the heart of genocidal destruction. Now when I say today we're going to focus on perpetrators, I don't by that mean to say, today we're going to focus on the architects of genocide, the men and women who make the policies of destruction in the Holocaust, the Hitlers. Architects, absolutely pivotal to what happens in processes of genocidal destruction, but by and large, most architects never bloody their hands with the hard work of killing someone face to face. We're also not going to focus on the mid-level bureaucrats in the Holocaust, someone like an Adolf Eichmann, the people who do the paperwork, the people who do the organizing, the people who structure the systems of destruction so that vast numbers of people can be killed and destroyed. Are those mid-level bureaucrats important? Absolutely they are. But again, by and large, most of them never kill them, kill someone face to face with their own hands. What we're going to focus on today are the rank and file, the low-level perpetrator, the people who actually pull the trigger, the people who actually swing the machete, the people who literally bloody their hands with the hard work of killing. It's not that they're more important than architects or mid-level bureaucrats in the processes of genocidal destruction, but without the killers, we can have all the policy we want. We can have all the paperwork we want. We can have all the organization we want. If we don't have the people to actually carry out the killing itself, the killing's not going to happen. So for a long time, I'd say up until the past 10 to 15 years, these are the people we've known the least about, the rank and file, and today we want to talk about those people. And let me start with an uh, example from one of the places I visit often and study, that is Rwanda. Many of you know that two days from now, Rwanda will be commemorating the 22nd year 
since the genocide began uh, April 7, 1994. Over the course of 100 days, 800,000 Rwandan, Tutsi and moderate Hutu, killed by Hutu extremists, simply on the basis of identity in the case of Tutsi, on the basis of political affiliation or political leanings in the case of moderate Hutu. 800,000 people in 100 days. You can take any 100-day segment of any other genocide, including the Holocaust, you won't find that rate of killing. It was a frenzy of killing. Not done with sophisticated weaponry, not done with a terrible amount of ammunition, rifles, handguns, assault weapons, very small part in the genocide, done mostly with machete, done mostly with masu, clubs with nails driven through them so they protrude from the other side. I've had the chance to interview close to 200 perpetrators in Rwanda, rank and file killers in prison are people who've already been released from prison. One of the questions we ask in the interview is, are there any physical problems you have as a result of your participation in the genocide? And one of the things we'll often hear is, I have a broke shoulder, or I have a torn shoulder. And what they're saying, what you and I would recognize as, is they have a torn rotator cuff. In other words, during the killing, they killed so often, so, frequent, so frequently, with such violence and such intensity, and sometimes with a dull machete, that it actually tore the muscles in the shoulder as they kept making that repetitive motion. So Rwanda was, uh, I think every genocide offers its own unique points. Rwanda certainly has this unique point of this frenzy, incredible rate of killing in a country the size of Vermont over the course of 100 days. When I go to Rwanda, I interview perpetrators. As I said, some in prison, some out of prison. Uh, I also interview survivors, because I'm interested in asking survivors, how did you think the perpetrators were thinking of you in the midst of this? So as you think about, as a victim, as a survivor, what the perpetrators are doing, how do you explain what they do and how they've come to do this, especially as in the case in Rwanda, when so many of the killers were literally next door neighbors. And so I was interviewing years ago one woman who had survived a massacre at a small church, a small church, fairly large church in Rwanda, where several thousand people had died. If you study Rwandan history, you'll know that from 1959 to 62, there was an earlier round of killings where Hutu extremists targeted Tutsis, and because of that, several thousand, hundred thousand Tutsi fled Rwanda to Uganda and neighboring countries. Those that survived in 59 to 62 survived because Tutsi husbands and fathers and sons said to their wives, their mothers, and their daughters, go to the church. You'll be safe in the church. The killers won't come into the church. In 59 to 62, thousands of Tutsi fled to the churches, and they were safe. The Hutu killers didn't come there. In 1994, 22 years ago, almost to this day, when the killing started again, Tutsi husbands, fathers, and sons said to their loved ones, go to the church. You'll be safe in the church. But 1994 was different. 1994, for the Hutu extremists, this was going to be their version of a final solution. So all the people fleeing to the church basically rounded themselves up for extermination, thinking they would be safe, they were all in one place. Hutu extremists would come to the churches, and you can still see this several places in Rwanda today for memorials, lob grenades at the church doors and windows, break into the church, and they'd kill. They'd rape, certainly they'd kill everyone in the church, and for years those churches have remained as places of memory. The woman I was interviewing several years ago, we went back to the site of this massacre that she had survived. It was the first time she'd ever been back to it. Uh, when I first met her, I saw the deep machete wound on her neck that looked so grievous. You know, 15 years later, you thought, how would anyone ever survive a wound like that? But she had survived. She'd been in this church. She'd been knocked unconscious when a grenade was launched into the church. She woke up. Uh, she felt herself being attacked. She lifted her arms to stop some of the machete cuts. One cut got through and cut her neck. The killers left her because they thought she was dead. 
She wasn't dead. She was able, in the frenzy of killing, to climb out of the window. She climbed out of the window of the main church, and she was able to crawl. I mean, she's grievously wounded, but able to crawl to the backside of a smaller brick building that had served for years as a Sunday school for the children who would come to this church. She stayed behind this building for about a day and a half, lapsing out of consciousness. She'd be conscious again. She'd lapse out again. But every time she woke up behind this church, she heard the same sound, just a loud clap. She knew it wasn't a shot. Uh, she knew it wasn't machete. It didn't sound like machete hitting flesh. But there'd be a few seconds, and she'd hear it again. A few seconds, she'd hear it again. She'd lapse out of consciousness. She'd wake up, and she kept hearing the sound, this thud, that she just could not imagine what this would be. After a time, the killer's left. She's able to regain consciousness again. She crawls around to the front of this small building that she's been hiding behind, and this is what she sees in that building. Oh, sorry, thank you. That's a little sluggish. She sees this in the building, and you can still this, see this today if you visit Rwanda. She sees in the front left corner a large blood stain, and she sees scattered on these concrete barriers, which are pews, the bodies of dozens and dozens of children who have been killed over the course of these two days at the church by a killer recognizing why waste a machete, a sharp machete on a child, when the child can be killed simply by picking the child up by the feet and swinging it headfirst against the wall? The sound she had heard as she came into and out of consciousness, the sound she heard were children being swung headfirst against this wall and then tossed off to the side, another child being picked up and killed the same way. Unless you think there's something very uniquely Rwandan about this brutal style of killing. We've seen this in most every case of genocide. Uh, U.S. cavalrymen in the 1800s, late 1800s, killed Native American children in the same way, throwing them headfirst against a tree to save ammunition. Uh, in the Armenian genocide, we have cases of children being killed this way. In the Holocaust, we have cases of children being killed this way. If you visit Cambodia today, some of their memorials are what they call killing trees, where children were thrown headfirst against trees in this way as well. So our question becomes, in the midst of this, who does something like this? Who is the person picking up children by their feet in this sacred place, this place of worship, this place of Christian understanding, who is the person picking people up by their feet and throwing them headfirst against the wall? What's the easiest explanation? What's the one that most people would jump to for this? Sherry? There's like 200 people in here and there's no one named Sherry? It's like, st <laughs> it's like statistically improbable for your generation for that to have happened. What, what's the reason? Yeah, so maybe we look at it and we say they don't see him as human anymore. But how are we likely to describe the person who does this killing? What's going to be easiest for us? Yes. They're crazy. What else? Yeah. They're male. Very likely male. Most of them are. Sociopaths. They're monsters. They're people incredibly unlike you and I. And that's the safest assumption for us. I mean, it's the quickest assumption for us because it's the safest. If the people who do this type of killing, and if you visit this site in Rwanda today, you, still, you see the stain still, 22 years later. It's not been preserved. It's not been painted over. It's not been taken care of in any way. The blood runs so deep in the brick that it's there, and it's going to be there for our lives. So the safest thing for us to say is, I can't imagine knowing anyone who would ever do something like this. And that takes me to the second part of the story, just one of those incredible research coincidences. I think it was the second uh, trip I made, two trips later, to Rwanda. I was interviewing a perpetrator in prison, and I was given his file, 
And when I was given his file before the interview started, something kind of, I mean, I just felt, something in it felt familiar. I couldn't put my finger on what it was. He came in, the interview started. I don't really typically ask who, what, when, why, uh, where. I'm more interested in the why and the how and what were you thinking as this process was ongoing. But something he said very early in the interview struck me and I followed up with another question and pretty quickly realized that this was the man in this place. That just by coincidence, I was sitting with a person who had done most of this killing in this small church and by his own admission had only stopped when his arms got tired and he ordered someone else to do it. Now again, the simplest thing would be for me to say to you, he was a sociopath, he was a monster, he was crazy, he was uneducated, he's illiterate, he's immoral, that he's completely different from anyone you and I would know. But in truth, with his story, and I think his story is fairly typical, he was anything but that. He was very well educated for his village, and this was his village where he did the killing. This was his church where he did the killing. This is the room where his children, his Hutu children, came to church. He was a school teacher in this village. We asked him the question, were any of the children you killed in this church, your church, were any of the children your students? He said, yes. He was the football, the soccer coach in this village. We asked, were any of the children you killed in this village your players? He said, yes, some of the children had played for me. Uh, on the football team. When we visited the village again, to a person, people in the village said, he was a great guy. He was a member of the church, this church where he did the killing. Uh, he was a great father. He was a great husband. He was a great son. He was the least likely person to do anything like this. He was one of the most admired people in the village, and yet he finds himself, by his own choices and by his own admission, swinging children headfirst against the wall and killing them this way in the genocide. Children that he didn't, it wasn't children he didn't know. Children he knew, children he had grown up with, the parents of, children he taught, children he coached, children he worshiped with. And so the question for us becomes, how does this happen? I mean, if it's true that it's only crazy people who do this, you know, we can finish now and go out and enjoy the rest of the day and call it a day and enjoy the beauty of the sun, because there isn't much to unpack. But if the truth is, as I'm going to argue, that most often the people who perpetrate these atrocities are very much like this man, very much like you and I, then the question, the compelling question becomes, how do they do it? How do they become transformed to be capable of something like this? So what we're going to look at, then, is that question. And we'll start with this general principle that I think, generally speaking, when a political, social, religious group comes to power and they want to commit mass murder, they usually do. But think for me for a second, if you're part of a group that comes to power and you want to commit mass murder, what are the obstacles you have to overcome? In other words, what's going to stop you from doing that? What are you going to have to work through to successfully, in your mindset, commit genocide, commit murder on a large scale. What are the things you have to overcome? Yeah? Good. You need to get your own group to support what's going on. So there may be people in your country who would stand up and say, I don't care how you feel about Jews, Armenians, Tutsi, Native Americans, other Khmer, it doesn't matter to me how you feel about them, we can't do this type of thing and still call ourselves civilized. So every genocidal regime has to worry about its own people who may stand up and say, no, this, this isn't something we should do. What else do they have to worry about? What else could stop them? Yeah. Okay, they can dehumanize them, so that's going to be one of the steps they can take to do this that we'll talk about in a few moments. What else can stop a regime from doing this? Yeah. Yeah. International concern. This is what we hope, is that the rest of the world is going to step in and step up and say, y you can't do this. This isn't how politics works. This isn't how you deal with diversity. 
is to simply slaughter a group of people with whom you have some disagreement or you see as a threat or you simply don't want to live with them any longer. So all of these little, I mean, you have to worry about mechanical things. If you're going to get, commit mass murder on this large scale, what do you do with the bodies? I mean, that's an important mechanical issue people don't think about. If you're going to kill six million Jews, what are the body disposal arrangements that have to be considered for six million? You're a country the size of Vermont, heavily populated, you kill 800,000 people. I, what do you do with those bodies? I mean, that's no small thing to leave unconsidered. In Rwanda, people will tell you at the height of the genocide, so many bodies were flying down, uh, flowing down the Kagera River that you could almost cross this river, just stepping on body to body to body just to get across a river. So body disposal is important. But what's always struck me is that the one thing a genocidal regime doesn't have to worry about is finding the killers. They can always find the killers. In other words, no genocidal regime we know of has had to step back and say, as much as we'd love to kill this group of people, we simply can't find the people to carry out the killing. They can always find the people to carry out the killing. Now, sometimes we sidestep this and we say, well, that's because the killers and the military and the military have to do what they're told. Uh, that's a misunderstanding of military codes of conduct from most civilized countries in the world that don't have to obey an illegal order. It's also a misunderstanding of how genocide unfolds, where in many cases, as we see in Rwanda, we have neighbors killing neighbors. We don't have that extensive military involvement. So I think this is one of the most disturbing things we come face to face with is if we let a regime come to power and start to present plans of genocide, organize plans of genocide, we should never sit back and say, well, we shouldn't worry about it because they'll never find the killers to carry it out. They'll always find the men, like you see in this image, on the edge of a pit, the men and women willing to pull a trigger, willing to swing the machete, willing to do what they have to do to carry out the killing that's necessary in genocide. So our two research questions are one, how many people does it take to carry out genocide and mass killing? This is a difficult question that um, most often people don't stop, you know, think to stop and ask. When I teach my course in Introduction to Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State, uh, first class of the semester, we asked some basic questions about cultural literacy that people have about genocide. Most everyone, as a matter of cultural literacy, knows that about six million Jews died in the Holocaust. If you ask the follow-up question, how many people does it take to kill six million people, uh, students will start to say, we have Hitler and Himmler and Gattering and Gerber, and stop and say, no, those were bad men, they were architects, they didn't actually kill anyone face to face. How many people does it take to kill, to carry out the policies those men develop? We don't often ask those questions because it's really difficult to find the answers. Because by and large, most perpetrators who've committed these atrocities, once the atrocities are over, what happens to them, the rank and file? Sorry? Nothing, nothing happened. And by and large, rank and file killers will go unpunished. We'll get a few of the really notorious ones. And Rwanda, of all post-genocide countries, has done the best in bringing rank and file perpetrators to justice. By and large, the rank and file will get away. Who we go after at the international level, the tribunals, we go after architects, we go after some mid-level bureaucrats, some notorious rank and file, but most of the rank and file we're never going to bring to justice. Anytime I'm in Serbia, or in public Serbsk, I was just there last June, Almost any military or police personnel of a certain age, roughly my age, I meet, was likely involved in the commission of atrocities uh, during the 1992-95 Yugoslav Wars. And that not only have they got away with it, but they still hold positions of influence in the military, in police, security sector, legal sector, political sector. They're just There's been no punishment for it. And unfortunately, this is a sad truth about most post-genocide societies, is that genocide overwhelms justice. I mean, once genocide's over, justice really doesn't know how to deal with all the people involved with it. Uh, we'll go back to Rwanda. After the genocide was over in Rwanda on July 4th, 1994, Rwanda had seven 
judges and lawyers left alive. I, you know, your, your justice system can't do it. It can't keep up with it. It can't do anything that quickly. So all we have are estimates. In the Holocaust, we can estimate about 500,000 Germans, Austrians, Croats, uh, Latvians, Lithuanians, involved as face-to-face -face killers. Uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, the national courts of Bosnia-Herzegovina suggest that there are about 27,000 Serb perpetrators still living their lives at, at, you know, free and at large, who are probably never going to be brought to justice. Rwanda, the first time I visited, a uh, friend said he thought there were over a million perpetrators. Now, we knew there were about 800,000 victims, a million perpetrators in a country the size of Vermont, and we realized later that number was inflated, but at the time we thought it possible because so much of the killing was done by groups of people ganging up on smaller numbers of victims. But at the end of the day in Rwanda, we still think about 270,000 Rwandans picked up machete, picked up masu, and actively killed someone else in that 100 days of killing. So even though the numbers will never be precise, I think we can go forward agreeing that for genocide to be successful, it's going to take thousands and thousands, I mean, a large number of perpetrators willing to actually do the killing. And that brings me to the second research question, which is the central one, is who are these people? How are they enlisted to do this type of killing? And this question for me uh, really stemmed from an article I read in 1992 by Christopher Browning. And Chris has one, written one of the most outstanding and well-known books on Holocaust perpetrators, uh, Ordinary Men, Reserve Police Battalion 101, and The Final Solution in Poland. And Chris, before he wrote the book, had written an article where he wrote this sentence. And this is one of those times in a professional career, and I think many of us have these, where you come across a sentence somewhere. And I still remember where I was sitting when I read the sentence. I kind of remember what I was wearing when I read the sentence. It's one of those flashbulb memories. Because when I read it, I thought, yeah, this is exactly what I want to do. This is exactly what I think I can help in trying to understand. And the sentence was this. Can one recapture, Chris wrote, the experiential history of these killers? The choices they faced, the emotions they felt, the coping mechanisms they employed, the changes they underwent. Chris was asking, is it possible to do that? And I've spent then since that time, close to 25 years, saying, yeah, I think this is possible. I think we can recapture this experiential history. What choices did perpetrators think they felt? I don't care what choices you and I think they had. That's irrelevant to their behavior. What's relevant to their behavior is what choices do they think they had. So when a perpetrator says to me in the interview, I had no choice to do it because they were going to kill my family, and I know that in that district or that case, no one's families were killed, and the other perpetrators said no, and nothing happened to their families, that truth doesn't matter to his perceived truth, which is, if I didn't do it, they were going to kill my family. I want to know how that affects his behavior. What emotions did he feel? What coping mechanisms did they employ? What changes did they undergo? You know, this really hits me, I think, every year when I'm at Auschwitz. Um, I go to Auschwitz three or four times a year, and we bring, through the Auschwitz Institute, about 20, 25 government officials from around the world to the grounds of Auschwitz for a one-week training on genocide prevention. They get in one week what you're getting over the course of a semester in many ways. Uh, we've trained about 250 government officials from over 70 countries uh, now at these seminars. And one of the key points of the training is the Tuesday when we take them as a group to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And they walk the grounds of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and if you've seen the images, they come to Birkenau and they're facing inward. They're looking at everything inside this place of death, the world's largest cemetery. And they're looking inside and imagining the horrors of what happened there. Uh, I probably have been to that camp now 20, uh, over 25 times. I find myself when I'm there looking the other direction. I'm looking outside, and what I'm seeing across a two-lane street are homes, many of which 
were there when Birkenau was a killing center, some of which have been rebuilt on the ruins of homes that were torn down uh, after the killing center was liberated. And I'm looking at these homes because these were the homes of the personnel who staffed Auschwitz, the people who did the hard work of killing at Auschwitz. And it wasn't just dormitories, these were family homes. So most of the men at Auschwitz who did the work of killing at the largest death camp in the East would stay at home for the night, wife, children. They'd go the next day into their job, and their job was killing. And they did that job for 8, 10, 12 hours. And at night, they came back out of that place. They crossed this two-lane street, and they went back to their home. And I wasn't there, but I can assume their wife hugged them when they came in. Their children ran to them and hugged them. They had a meal on the table for the father. I can assume the father probably read books to his children before they went to bed at night. It was as normal a home life as it could possibly be in that place. What are the emotions that you feel when your day job is killing? And at night, you go home, just a stone's throw from where you've done that work, and you're with family again. How do you, what, what's going on psychologically, internally, that allows you to navigate those two very different life experiences? I think of one Rwandan perpetrator I've interviewed who spoke of his, his time. The judge asked him in his trial, how many people did you kill? And he, he was honest. I really think he was trying to come clean. And he kept saying to the judge, judges, I can't tell you. I don't know how many people I killed because every day I woke up, it was the same. My wife made me breakfast. My son sharpened the machete. I took the machete out after breakfast. I went down into the swamps because I knew that's where the Tootsie were hiding. I'd grab one Tootsie and pull them out. I'd hack the back of their Achilles tendon so they couldn't run away. I'd leave them on shore. I'd go back into the swamp. I'd grab another. I'd do the same. When I had four, five, or six on shore, I, I came back. Sometimes I raped. Always I killed. After I killed, my wife came down. She took off the clothing. She washed the clothing. We sold it at market. I went home that night. I had dinner. And he said, judges, I did that day after day after day. I can't tell you how many people I killed. What are the transformations someone undergoes to do this? What are the coping mechanisms they employ? What type of emotions do they feel? Um, I'm not the first person to ask this question. Sorry, this is being a little sluggish today. <coughs> uh, people, people have asked it before me. Uh, before me, people have focused on different responses to this. Um, some of the responses have been killers like this become killers because it's part of what is the extraordinary nature of the collective. In other words, that <clears throat> there's something <clears throat> extraordinary <clears throat> excuse me, about the nature of a group that helps explain this. Now, I understand this cognitive inclination that when you see something extraordinary, and what could be more extraordinary than a killer hurling children headfirst against a brick wall to kill them? That's extraordinary, by every meaning of the word. Cognitively, we assume that that extraordinary effect has to have an extraordinary cause. And really, what I'm challenging you to do, if you read the book, if you're here today and listening, is I challenge you to say, can we sever that assumption and say, here could be an extraordinary effect that actually has a very ordinary cause. Because that's basically what I'm trying to argue, is we don't have to reach for the extraordinary to understand this. This extraordinary behavior has some very ordinary causes. Again, not all people have agreed. Some people have said it's the nature of the collective that brings this about, that when groups come together, bad things happen. Uh, you've been part of groups where that's been true. Groups of people have come together, bad things have happened, but you've been part of groups where Groups of people have come together and some pretty good things have happened as well. What groups do is what this microphone does to my voice. It doesn't change my voice, it amplifies my voice. It exaggerates, accentuates my voice. 
That's what groups do to the tendencies of people within them. If you bring together a group of people who individually are pretty nasty people with some pretty nasty inclinations, as a group, they'll probably become a little bit more creative, a little bit more nasty. The group will accentuate who they are, just as my microphone is doing that to my voice. But groups of good people come together, and the groupness accentuates the goodness, the good inclinations of those people as well. So we have to be careful about the groups. Are groups important? Absolutely. But do groups automatically mean that people in a group devolve into a mob mentality of some, point, of some type? I don't think that's true. Other people said it's an ideology, that when people have an extraordinary belief system, ideology means a worldview or a belief system, that when people have some extraordinary ideology, that ideology drives their behavior. What they believe makes them behave in these uh, cruel and atrocious ways. Again, I think ideology is important, but for most of the perpetrators I've interviewed, ideology hasn't been a major motivation. They've been motivated by greed. They wanted uh, the tin roofing from a ceiling in Rwanda, someone's goat, someone's radio, someone's land in Bosnia, someone's possessions in the Holocaust. I mean, that's not ideology. That's greed. That's a base human motivation. But I think I also recognize that often what happens with ideology is you and I tend to think of it as what you believe drives how you behave. And that can be true. But also how you behave can drive what you believe. In other words, ideology is not always the cause of behavior. Sometimes it's the consequence of behavior. It's how we justify behavior. So American historians, I think, in nearly one voice today would say something they wouldn't have said 50 years ago, which is the relationship between racism and slavery is not that we had racism and that's what led to the economic system of slavery. It is that we had slavery that worked well economically and then to justify why slavery was a good thing, we created this ideology of hateful racism. So we want to be careful about where we put ideology and understanding perpetrator behavior. And then finally, and this is the most common, some people have said, really the perpetrators have to be um, something about the mentally unusual or unstable. Uh, this is what I've called the mad Nazi thesis, that perpetrators have to be sociopaths, they have to be psychopaths, there has to be something mentally wrong with people who commit these atrocities. And fortunately, we had the chance to test this at Nuremberg. 1945-46, we have the first set of what are called the Nuremberg Trials and then subsequent Nuremberg Trials. This first set of trials, we had 22 Nazi leaders on trial. Actually, only 21 of them make it to trial because one Nazi kills himself before the trial starts, Robert Ley. And Ley's case is interesting because he kills himself and then they do an autopsy on his brain. And the first report on the autopsy is, Lay's brain is small. It's not wrinkled the way it's supposed to be. It looks deformed. And it makes international news. Because people say, wow, oh, this is why the Nazis were terrible. They had deformed brains. And now we have the scientific proof for it. Well, a few months later, Someone else did the same uh, research on Lay's brain without knowing who it was, and it turns out for his height and weight, his brain was perfectly sized. It was perfectly fine. That didn't make news, because that's, no one wants to hear that. They want to hear about the Nazi brain that's deformed. So even with the 21 on trial, this is our, our tendency is to not ask the question, are they mentally ill? The question is, how mentally ill are they? How deep does this run? How, can we even see it in their intelligence? So for instance, with these 21, many of them were given IQ tests. IQ tests are normed at what? What's the normal score for an IQ test? I'm sorry? 100. People are always hesitant to answer that one, because if you get that one wrong, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> if you get the average score on the IQ test wrong, it's a little off. But it's 100, exactly right. Um, if you go to college and graduate, 110. 
And if you go on and get a PhD, IQs tend to norm around 120. I work with PhDs, I am a PhD. 80 to 90 at our best, <laughs> top days, 80 to 90, but 120. Um, when we give the IQ test to the Nazis, what are we hoping to see in their intelligence? Low? Why? I'm sorry? It's good justification. If it's low, and forgive me on this because it's not a technical term, if they're stupid, <laughs> we can fix stupid. That's what education is for. So what we hope to see in the intelligence test is they're not very bright guys because we can fix that. Education can make them smarter, therefore education can stop this from happening. What do we see from the results? They score well over 100. Some of them are scoring 130, 140, close to gen genius range. Every Nazi test at Nuremberg is scoring well above the average norm for IQ test. So that's a little disturbing to the world. But we, so we go to the next step, which is to say, okay, they're smart, we can deal with that, that's not what we wanted to see, but we'll take that, but surely they must have been mentally ill. And to answer that question, we gave them this test. This is a Rorschach test. You know the Rorschach test from what? What do you know Rorschach from? Watchmen, yeah. <laughs> is, most of you know the Rorschach test from the movie Watchmen. But it's actually a psychological test that's been around for decades and decades, and people always make fun of it. It's, it's kind of the butt of jokes in popular culture and everything else. In truth, in 1945, it was the single most commonly used test of pathology in the world. In truth, in 2016, it's still the most single used test of pathology across the world. So for all the times we make fun of it in popular culture, it is what we rely on to try to get a sense of someone's underlying pathology. The war shocks are given to several of the Nazi defendants. Again, what we're hoping to see here is what? Good, it's not a technical term, but we'll go with it. We're hoping to see crazy. We want to see crazy here because then, if it's crazy, if it's pathology, if it's some type of mental disturbance, we can see that coming. That doesn't come out of nowhere. We can see it coming and we can protect ourselves from that. Uh, all the tests we give to the Nazi defendants, all but one of them tested well within the bounds of normality. And it's interesting to see the world's reaction to this. I still remember Kansas City Observer editorial. After these results came out, the editorialist said, well, something must be wrong with the field of psychology if they can't find these people crazy. I mean, that's how much we wanted to hold on to the bad Nazi thesis. We just said, well, psychology's screwed up if these men aren't crazy. The only one it identifies as pathological is Julia Stryker. And Julia Stryker was editor of Der Sturma. Most of the terrible anti-Semitic images you've seen throughout the semester probably have come from the mind of, of uh, Julia Stryker and the pages of Der Sturma. But here's what you need to know about Stryker, is before the Nuremberg trial started, the rest of the Nazi defendants went to counsel and said, we know we're gonna be tried, we don't think it's fair, but we don't wanna be tried with Julia Stryker. When a Nazi says about you that being tried with you would make them look bad, that's pretty far down the ladder. So even his co-defendants knew Stryker was pathological, and he was. But all the other Nazi defendants test well within the bounds of, of normality. We've done similar tests with rank-and-file killers in the Copenhagen trials after the Holocaust. Same results. We have similar tests from Rwanda. Uh, same results. Similar tests from Cambodia. Same results as well that the rank-and-file killers really suffer from no higher than normal rate of pathology, you could even make an argument, as I try to make in the book, that there are probably reasons to suggest that they suffer from lower than normal rates of pathology, given the assigned duties of, uh, of their task of killing. So that also leads us to a second question of, if they're not mad Nazis, then at least they're bad Nazis. There's something twisted about their personality. Maybe they're not pathological, but certainly there's some type of what people have called the Nazi personality that helps explain how they come to do what they do. 
And this is a very, if you've read this part of the book, I apologize in advance. It's boring. When I wrote it, I started bringing a pillow to my office because I was falling asleep writing it. I read over it now, and I'm like, oh my god, that was just horrible. It's a horribly long, complicated story. The short version is, as long as we've looked for this Nazi personality, this set of personality traits that perpetrators could share that make them more prone to committing atrocities, we've looked for it for decades. We, don't, we haven't found it. There's no magic personality type or magic personality syndrome or cluster of personality traits that help us predict who's more likely to perpetrate these atrocities and who's less likely to perpetrate these atrocities. So with all that said, what it leaves us with is the central argument of the work that I do, which is it's ordinary people like you and me who commit genocide and mass killing. W.H. Auden has said this about evil. Evil is unspectacular and always human. Auden here is not talking about the consequences of evil. I mean, the evil we've talked about today, the evil you've talked about all semester, it's spectacular in its destruction. He's talking about the origins of evil. It's unspectacular. It's always human. And the close to 200 perpetrators I've interviewed, I can count on one hand the ones I've sat with, and I felt no point of human connection. That, that across from me sat someone who seemed to defy everything I'd say here about ordinary people. One hand, I could count those people. All the others I've talked to, they were unspectacular, they were human, they were people's children, they celebrated birthdays, they had loved ones, they were loved by people, they asked questions about English Premier League football. I mean, it just, it was the ordinariness of the unspectacular nature of who they are that was completely different from the spectacular crimes they had committed. But the origins of them as people, unspectacular, always human, very difficult argument to admit, to understand, to absorb. Why is this so difficult for us to embrace this argument? Why is it so hard to believe that it's ordinary people like this who, who do this type of work? Yeah. Good. Yeah, this is typically where we start is exactly that. If you didn't hear it, it's that we're afraid because we look around us in this room and we think, wow, if this is true, there are people sitting in this room who could be capable of these atrocities. You kind of cross your arms and your seats don't move, but you begin to lean over a little bit because you're looking at the person next to you going, you know, I could see this. I could see this happening. <laughs> If given the case, you're starting to kind of edge over in your seat, and that's part of the learning, is what it says about everyone else in this room. What's the second part of it? Yes? Yeah, the second part is, now everybody's moving from her. The second <laughs> part is not just what it says about everyone else in this room, what it says about me, what it says about you and I, what it says about our capacity to do something like this. And it's that, I think, self-awareness, self-insight, self-admission to some degree, where you say, could it be possible that in a situation like this, I could be capable of these type of atrocities? That's what makes this so hard to admit, to understand, to absorb, to live with. Uh, the first edition came out in 2002, Second edition of this book, 2007. Third edition's coming. It'll, it'll be here at some point. Um, if none of those books had sold, if they hadn't gone to different editions and no one was reading them or whatever, I'd be disappointed, but I'd still feel it was worthwhile for me because of what I learned about who I am, what I learned about my place in this world, what I learned about the world I, lived, I live in. I think that insight for me has been helpful. Now, the danger of this argument that saying we recognize this ordinary people like you and I who do this, what's the danger of it? What risk do we run? Yes? Good. So if, if it's everyone who can do this, then the early signs become difficult. And that is absolutely true. I mean, if we can't identify it because it's pathological people, because it's people with this personality, because it's people from this part of the world, 
If it's true that all of us have this capacity, it makes prediction difficult, but it also requires diligence to say, if we do have this capacity, this is why it's so important that democracy be nurtured. This is why it's so important that inclusivity be taught. This is why it's so important that tolerance be part of how we understand and work and appreciate each other because we recognize this potential within each of us. What else is difficult about it? Yes? Uh huh. Yeah. Good, and we're going to come back to that gender question in a bit. And if we don't, please raise it again at the end. Yes? Female perpetrators? We'll come back to, we're getting back to gender, so trust me, we'll get back there. The thing we want to emphasize here, though, is that, yeah. Good, so may, maybe part of it is if we're all capable of this, then how in the world do we stop it? And part of it is also, I, I don't want you to hear when I say it's ordinary people like you and I who do this, and now we're gonna talk a bit about how we come to do it. Sometimes you leave here and you find yourself feeling more sympathy for perpetrators, more forgiveness for perpetrators, more apologetic for perpetrators. That's not what we're trying to do with this. We're trying to explain and understand behavior because we want to stop it from happening. We want to know what are the things that lead people to do evil so we know where we can cut those things off. There's no part of this that's about excusing, apologizing, asking for forgiveness of perpetrators. That's not part of the understanding. What we're trying to do is understand. Those moral issues of apology, forgiveness, excuse, those are separate issues for, uh, for us. And if we, we understand, we don't have to give those up. It's not a choice of one or the other. We're trying to understand a behavior and at the same time saying that behavior we're understanding is still freely chosen. So for every perpetrator I speak with, there are dozens, hundreds of people in their village that never did what they did. Subject to the same influences, never made those same choices. So we hold on to the moral responsibility, we hold on to the legal and moral accountability, and that's not threatened when we say that it's ordinary people like you and I who do this. So what are the stages we go through um, <clears throat> to try and understand this? A few things first. Uh, these are some quotes from other people much smarter than me who have made the kind of the same arguments that we're trying to make here. Tina Rosenberg, Children of Cain, written about violent uh, offenders in Latin America. One of her chapters is about a perpetrator of genocide from Argentina, and Tina says this, I would have preferred them to be monsters. Come on, understand that this is not the case was disturbing for what it taught me about these people and ultimately about myself. I did not want to think that many of the violent are people like us, so civilized, so educated, so cultured, and because of that, so terrifying. If you came today and I said to you, all the people I study, perpetrators, rank and file, they're not anything like you or anyone you know, that's a feel-good story. You leave here and you're feeling good about who you are. But as Tina says, what's terrifying is they're educated, they're civilized, they're cultured. That's what's terrifying about the perpetrators. Daniel Farstein is another Argentinian social psychologist who said the metaphysical category of absolute evil distracts us, leaves us safe from the distress that might be caused by examining the genocidal potential latent in every modern society and all its members. The work we do with the Auschwitz Institute, this is what we base it on. Every society has genocidal potential because every society includes who? Us, and all of us have this potential. We work with countries, we don't, you know, we work with many countries around the world, we don't ask questions of what countries are at risk for genocide and what countries aren't. That's not the question. The question is, what are the different levels of risk each country has? I'm not gonna ask you, 
who in here is at risk for heart disease and who's not? You're all at risk for heart disease. You vary in the risk, but you're all at risk. Every country in the world's at risk for genocide. They just vary in the risk. Sometimes they don't understand this. I'll say something to you today that won't leave this room, and I appreciate that on your, your part. We work often with the U.S. government. I love the U.S. government. U.S. citizen, great country, beautiful place. U.S. government's tough to work with on this stuff because genocide prevention is just a foreign policy issue for the U.S. government. It has nothing to do with domestic concerns. It's just a concern about out there, other places. And it, understand the degree of frustration to sit in an office in Washington, D.C. and have government policymakers say to you, um, we know genocide's a real risk for many countries in the world, but it's never a risk for us and it's never been a problem for our country. And you're looking outside the windows of the office and you're saying, no, this, this country's founded on genocide and slavery, those twin evils. Your office said on land that wasn't your land, wasn't our land, it was someone else's land. How can you say it's a country that's had no connection to this? Are we relatively safe from genocide? Yes. Are we 100% guaranteed safe? No, no country is. So every country has the risk because every country has people in it like you and I who can put that country at risk. Manus Midlarski says we do far better to explain their descent into atrocity as human beings than as some mutated creatures whose behavior defies understanding. Latter instance, we claim no purchase on explanation and prevention, whereas in the former, if we understand them as human beings, we find some hope for the future. Jan Hatzfeld, a French journalist who's interviewed perpetrators in Rwanda and prisons different than the ones I work in typically, and Hatzfeld had said this in interviewing one of the prisoners. The prisoner said to him, at the time of those murders, I didn't even notice the tiny things that would change me into a killer, or the tiny thing that changed me into a killer. If you're asking me what I've spent the past 20, 25 years on, is I wanted to notice those tiny things. What is it that takes people like you and I, what are the tiny things, the tiny choices we make that transform us into people capable of these atrocities? Um, this is The uh, diagram from the book, which is also horrible, but publisher wanted it. But let's go kind of one by one just quickly to give an idea. Generally, when I try to unpack what these tiny things are, I look at them in three categories. One category is a very broad cultural category of saying all cultures differ in some characteristics. What are some cultural characteristics that would put a society at greater risk than another society. And these cultural characteristics aren't bad things necessarily. But if you're a member of a genocide regime and you come to power, what cultural characteristics might already be out there that would make it easier for you to do what you wanted to do, to kill large numbers of people? I think some of those characteristics are things like collectivistic values, authority orientation, social dominance. If what we want to destroy is a group of people based on identity. And we already have a culture that thinks about identity in a group sense, in a collectivistic sense. It's much easier to harness that us them mentality, much easier to bring that to the front and to use it as a justification for killing. In cultures that have a strong authority orientation, a strong social dominance, and some of this is related to gender, it's much easier to bring people into those authority structures and have them become part of that authoritarian system. So we'll use again Rwanda as an example. Rwanda's had a long history of a strong authority orientation so that when we talk with perpetrators in Rwanda and we begin to ask questions about disobedience, why didn't you disobey, why didn't you do something different here, even in the translation, as it goes into the native tongue in Kinyarwandan, you see the translator always struggles with how to frame the notion of disobedience, because it's just not something culturally that has been a large part of Rwandan society. We certainly see it in Nazi Germany. We certainly saw it in Cambodia, the strong sense of authority being very important to a culture. Now, this 
it's a necessary part of any culture. If we didn't have authority orientation in our culture, I'd be here today and it'd just be me. I think even my wife wouldn't have come today. It'd just be me speaking because none of the rest of you would be here. You're here because in part you're obeying authority about the need to be here for class credit and other things as well. So authority orientation is a big part of every culture, but in some cultures it's a bit more pronounced, and I think in those cultures it can be a characteristic that a genocidal regime can pull on. I think secondly, we look at how the other is defined, and for me, um, this is the most important group of tiny things that we can talk about with perpetrators, and some of you have already hit on these today. How do we think about the other in terms of us, them, thinking? How we think about the other morally as well? I think in the book, in the second edition, I call this moral disengagement. I've changed my mind on that. That's why people keep writing new editions of books. It's not moral disengagement. It's really just a moral reorientation. This is one of the most common questions I get about perpetrators, is how do they turn off their moral compass? I've never spoken with a perpetrator who turned his moral compass off. What have they done to their moral compass? They've shifted it. They've turned it in a different direction. So the perpetrators I speak with are fully moral people. Their morality just applies to this group of people. It doesn't apply to those people. And I, every perpetrator I've spoken with see themselves clearly as moral people religious people, doing God's will in some cases, but their morality is only oriented this direction. It doesn't include these people here. This shouldn't be a surprise to you and I. Our moral universes work the same way. Most of us have morality, a universal moral commitment directed cer directly to a certain group of people, but it does leave a lot of people out on the fringe, and I think that's part of understanding perpetrator behavior. The dehumanization of victims as part of this moral reorientation. The euphemistic labeling of the evil actions. Let me just give you two examples from the Holocaust. Raul Hilberg is one of the most famous Holocaust scholars who read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of Nazi documents, and he once said the first time he found the word killing was after thousands and thousands of pages, and he found the word killing in reference to a Nazi edict about how dogs, what today we call German shepherds, were to be put down, how they were to be killed. Now at the time that law was written, that policy was written in Nazi Germany, four to five million Jews had already been killed. And not a single reference to the word killing in Nazi policy and documentation because what was it called? Extermination, liquidation, final solution, cleansing, uh, removal, resettlement, all these things that perpetrators do to keep their actions at a distance. We also see, again, that importance, as some of you have said, about dehumanization. Franz Stangl was a commandant of Treblinka, one of the six death camps in the East, and at his trial, Stangl is asked by one of the uh, witnesses, he's asked, why? Why did you beat us? Why did you strip us? Why did you spit on us? Why did you curse us? Why did you do all these things? Because you were walking us, literally, from the cattle car to our death. That's what you were doing. Why on the way to putting us to death did you have to do all those other things to us? It seems unnecessary. And Stangl's response was remarkable. Stangl said, because it made it easier for my men to do what they had to do. If we treated you like animals, if we treated you less than human, it made it easier, uh, easier for us to do what we had to do, which was to put you to death. And then finally, when we think about the other, we can think about uh, blaming the victims as well. The notion that many times what perpetrators do and what bystanders do that allow continued victimization is we blame the victims for their own suffering. You see it closest to home with victims of rape and sexual violence. Uh, some of you are close friends of people who have been victimized. Some of you have been victimized yourself. Um, what are those questions that we ask at some point in the victim's recovery that will start to blame the victim? What do we ask? Yes? What were you wearing? Why were you there that time of night? What did you say? 
Why did you drink that much? Why did you look that way? All these things that heap on the victim additional blame, guilt, for their own victimization, when they may be self-blaming as well because of how society's taught them to think about this. But we want to blame the victim in many ways because cognitively, it makes our world safe and predictable. If I know you've been victimized because of something you've done, I don't have to worry about one day being unfairly victimized. I just won't do the same things you've done and I should be safe. But blaming the victim is often how perpetrators think about and justify their own perpetration. Uh, in the couple hundred interviews I've done, I've only interviewed one Holocaust perpetrator. It was 1990. Uh, in Berlin when the Cold Wall was coming down. And he was a well-known perpetrator. He'd been on numerous television shows and interviews. And I had about 45 minutes with him and asked a few questions. And everything went fine for 44 minutes. He said the right things. It was horrible what we did to the Jews. We shouldn't have done it. Uh, we did not use our minds. We lost our morality. We lost our conscience. And on and on and on. But I'll, I can never forget that final minute as we were wrapping up. He moved up in his chair sat up in his chair, and he put his finger in my face, and he said, but you do know they were going to take over the world. And I thought, oh, it's been 45 years, and the way you still live with yourself is you still have the same lie that allowed you to do what you did 45 years ago, that it's okay to kill these people, because if you don't, they're going to take over the world. Uh, in the book, I use the example of two a German couple at the end of the war when the camps in the East are being liquidated and the uh, living survivors are being marched back into the interior of Germany on the death marches and they're literally dying in rout on the marches and the husband and wife are at the living room window and these prisoners are being marched across their uh, front road and all the husband can think is to turn to his wife and say, my, what terrible things these Jews must have done to deserve this punishment. And you see the cognitive mistake there? All he can look is to say, man, they must have done something horrible to deserve this, because in his mind, victims get what they deserve. It's how perpetrators justify what they do, and it's how bystanders justify why it's okay to stand by, because certainly the victims must deserve some of their own victimization. And then finally, we can talk about the actual uh, social construction of cruelty. We'll wrap up here in about five minutes and then take your questions. Uh, in this one, this, I want us to go back to something I said to you earlier uh, today in the lecture, and that is, let's try to sever this relationship between extraordinary cause and effect and think about it very ordinarily. Uh, I have a box right here. I don't really have a box. I'm tired. I'm not that tired. But I have an imagin imaginary box here. In this box, are going to go all the things that affect you and I as individuals when we're in a group. So when you're in a group like you are now, what are the things that influence your behavior in that group? What are a few things? Yes? Going along to get along, conformity. You see what the group does? And you follow those things, especially when you're in a group and you're unsure about what the correct response is. You'll look around you and you'll follow whatever most people seem to be doing. We'll put that in this box. Conformity. What else do we have? What else affects your behavior in a group like this? Where you are? In what ways? Good. So who you're around in the situational context of where you are, that goes in here. Peer pressure goes in here. It's probably not anything you know anything about, but for many college students, peer pressure would go in this box. Uh, creativity. When you're in a group, some of you have sat here today and you've, you've thought, I have a question. I think I have an answer, but I'm just not sure, so I'm going to kind of raise my hand and just let it go down the back of my neck, and hopefully he's not going to call on Sophie again, because that's not good at all. But you're, you want to be good at what you do. You want to sound bright. You want to sound responsible. You want to be creative. All those things go in this box of groups we're in every day that we're a part of. So we're going to take that box up. We'll bring it over here to a group of perpetrators. Now what they do is different than what you and I do. They're killing. But I'm going to say we can take this box and we can dump it out right here 
And all these same things influence perp perpetrator behavior. They're conforming. They're influenced by peer pressure. They want to be good at what they, they do. They want to be creative at how they do what they do. All the group dynamics that affect us, they also affect perpetrators, even though what perpetrators are doing is very different than what you and I do. So those mechanics of what it means to live and work in groups, those same things apply to what it means to live and work in a group of people whose task happens to be killing other people. Now to wrap up, <clears throat> what I've asked you to do is to really think very differently about perpetrators. To not think about them as monstrous people, to not demonize them, to not focus on specific personalities, but to focus on the social psychology of perpetrators, to focus on humanizing them, to focus on the reality that any of us could be in whatever situation capable of these type of atrocities. Martha Minow said this, the response to mass atrocities has to resist what perpetrators do to their victims, which is dehumanize them. What I've asked you to do today is not dehumanize perpetrators. That's the easiest thing to do. But humanize them, not with the point of trying to excuse or understand, or excuse or forgive their behavior, but with the point of trying to understand the behavior. Because only by understanding how they come to do this can we have any hope of stopping it. I mean, we would never set still if some uh, bird flu or physical ailment hit us and just say, well, I'm, just, I'm not going to look at it. I'm going to close my eyes. I'll sit on my hands and just hope it goes away. We want to understand the cause of the disease because if we don't understand the cause of it, we can't stop it. And that's what I'm trying to suggest here with perpetrators. As easy as it is to close our eyes and say, it's horrible what they did and they're just very different, unusual people, we have to come to grips with the reality that they're much more similar to us than we'd like to think. And only in understanding how they come to do what they do can we start to understand how we can possibly uh, prevent it. That's important, and, and your attendance here, and I can't tell you how proud I am of you that you've chosen to be in this class this semester because you set in a world where this is absolutely necessary. You're not in a world where all the stories of genocide we'll talk about are all past history. They're all past case studies. Sometimes it feels like that. You live in a world in which we've got, as you see in this forecast sheet, 20 countries that we can look at and say, in this country, the wood is stacked. All the risk is in place for genocide. And in some of these countries, we've thrown gasoline on that wood. And in some of these countries, like Sudan and South Sudan and Burundi, we've lit a match to that wood that's been doused in gasoline. And those countries in Syria, Iraq, are experiencing genocidal violence even as we sit here. So the importance of what you're studying this semester and why it's trans formative for you in terms of your life is that you will leave this school and you'll leave this class understanding that you live in a world where these problems are not historical problems, these problems are contemporary problems. These problems are our problems, but these problems also have us as a possible solution to those problems as well. This is the you know, big final thing I want to finish with is to say that sometimes Genocide seems so vastly overwhelming. And I want you to leave here and recognize that genocide is a human problem. It doesn't come from elsewhere. We do it to ourselves. It's people like you and us doing this right now in Burundi and Syria and Iraq and other places. That's the bad news. The good news is if it's a human problem, it has a human solution. How do you be part of that sol solution? You follow the advice that Arthur Ashe, a famous tennis player and civil rights activist, gave years ago. Arthur Ashe um, also was an activist in AIDS research. And someone once said to Ashe, how do you keep doing what you're doing? You're, you're trying to fight for civil rights and equality. You're trying to fight against AIDS. Do you ever feel like you're making a difference? And Ashe said these three simple things. You start where you are, you use what you have, and you do what you can. In other words, if every single one of us you start where you are. You don't have to finish college. You don't have to be a, a college professor. You don't have to work in this field. Start where you are right now today. Use what you have 
which for many of you, all of you, you have things that I don't have access to to make a difference here, and do what you can, we can make a difference in this. We absolutely can solve this human problem that we have created. Uh, finally, if you're interested, uh, this is the new book that I mentioned in the introduction that is uh, coming out May 24th, uh, Confronting Evil. This is the second book of what's going to be a three-book trilogy on evil, Becoming Evil, Confronting Evil, and Legacies of Evil. And then I'm going to start writing uh, coloring books for children after that, <laughs> so we'll be done. Um, ten minutes, questions you want to ask, please. And if everyone can be attentive to the questions as well, that would be great. One here. Uh huh. Yeah, the question was, or the comment was, at the Nuremberg trials, a lot of the perpetrators said they were only obeying orders. And again, as we've said, that's particularly important in situations of authority orientation. But one of the things that happens in genocide is that people's conscience, perpetrators' conscience, they tend to willingly give over to someone else. And, and I want you to think about this a little bit closer to home. What are situations where you've given over your conscience and your responsibility to someone else and said, well, I didn't do anything because no one else was doing anything, or I didn't do anything because I was told to do something different. All of us find ourselves in these positions where we, we give away our moral responsibility, our moral accountability because we're part of a structure or because no one else is doing anything here. And you're exactly right. People at Nuremberg, every Nazi defendant said the same thing. I was following the orders of my state. The tribunal said, there are higher orders in your state, and regardless of what your state said, you violated those higher orders of human decency. Another question, yes? Um, no, that's a great qu our question was, have I ever had a chance to interview wives of perpetrators? Um, I think in a few occasions I have, and a few occasions I'm thinking of are in Rwanda, and in each occasion the wife of the perpetrator has remarried at that point. So there were a couple of occasions where I've done that, but I think that's its own fascinating line of research, is how do the family members remember, and we have some of this with, uh, with family members of Nazi uh, perpetrators, how do family remember, members remember that process of transformation that they saw a husband or a father or a brother undergo? And I think that would be a, you know, would be a great question to follow up on. I think it's, there are, and these questions of gender came up earlier as well, there are questions of gender with perpetrators that are important. I think I'm going to defer most of those to Wendy Lauer, who will be here in two weeks. Uh, Wendy's book on Hitler's Furies is kind of the most important uh, word on that, I would just say that in my experience, it's been less that women don't have the capacity to do these things, and it's more that in many genocidal societies, they're not given the opportunity. When given the opportunity, women can be just as vicious, just as creative, just as violent as their male counterparts can be, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Holocaust survivors of concentration camps, female concentration camps have told us that for years, but, so I don't think it's a capacity issue, I think it's more of an opportunity issue, but it'd be a great question to ask Wendy as well. Yes? Yeah, and that goes back to that choices they thought they felt. His question was, did they join the perpetrator side because they were afraid of being victims? Absolutely. Let me give you one example, uh, again from Wanda. The, there's one person who's a good friend in Rwanda who's Hutu who wasn't a perpetrator. He's about my age. But this is how he grew up in Rwanda. Every night, his mother would give him a machete and say to him, go down into the cellar, make sure there are no Tutsi in the cellar. And every night, from as, as young as he can remember, he drags a machete down to the cellar looking for Tutsi. He'd come back up and his mother would say, now go under every bed, lift the bedding, with a machete, make sure there are no Tutsi. He didn't know what he'd do if he saw one, but he was doing what his mother asked. Does he grow up with a sense that he can be a victim? Absolutely. I mean, to me, the surprise with him is he didn't become a perpetrator. 
that he chose not to kill because he grew up with that sense of, if I don't kill them, they will kill me. I think in every perpetrator's mindset is this idea that the person they're killing is a threat to them in some way, racially, religiously, economically, from a territorial perspective, and it's that subjective perception of threat that perpetrators really draw on to begin to justify their behavior. It's a good question. A couple, two more questions, one here, then here, or three, here, here, and here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, so she's calling me out here. Um, what do you say when you sit with U.S. government people and you say, and you hear them say, genocide is just foreign policy? Well, I don't ever, s <laughs> this is going to sound incredibly cowardly. Um, in diplomatic circles, the engagement is what has to be kept, even if the engagement is with President Assad. Or, or Bashir, even with someone who's horrible. If you cut off the engagement, you've cut off every chance you have to influence them. So I think in the policymaking circles, you always want to keep that engagement. So am I gonna stand up and pound the table and say, I can't believe you said that when you look outside, you're right here, this is native land and da da. No, I'm not. Am I going to make a point to say, as kindly as I can, every country in the world's at risk of genocide. We know it's easiest for you to think of it as foreign policy, but it's, we're at risk. We're at lower risk than other countries, but we're still at risk. And yes, it's part of foreign policy, but it also has to inform domestic policy. Can we push in those ways? Absolutely, because that keeps the engagement going. And I think, I think they hear that. And in truth, I'm thinking of the most recent time this happened in uh, last April in DC, someone else at the table, a US government policymaker, spoke up and said, you do realize where we're setting right now. And so it's great when other people call them on it. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. But that engagement piece is an important one. And yeah, it's a great question. Here and then back there. Great question. I'm not going to answer that question at all either. I'm just going to no. That it's a great question. In my course, when I understand that conflict, I borrow an analogy from a Rwandan friend who said, "Every Rwandan, even those in the countryside who can't read, they know their national history as a necklace, and on that necklace are five beads, and every one of those beads represents a point in history. 1885 is the arrival of colonial government." Uh, another year, it's a genocide in Burundi. 59 to 62 is the Hutu social revolution. 1990s, the invasion of uh, Ugandan-born Ugandan Rwandans from Uganda. 1994 is a genocide. So all Rwandans kind of know this national history. So I think when you ask a question, which is a great one, how do we understand this divide? That question really goes back to 1885, and it's very much influenced as in, as is much of Africa by colonial influences on the country in which Belgian colonizers by the early 1900s have such a difficult time distinguishing between Hutu and Tutsi because the physical differences are relatively minor because there's been so much intermarriage that it's the Belgian colonizers who institute identity cards and say everyone has to carry a card saying Hutu or Tutsi and what Hutu and Tutsi have historically thought of as socioeconomic caste now become ethnic entrenched identities. Now, have Hutu and Tutsi always got along in Rwanda for all their history? No. But when did it become entrenched in ways that became very divisive? I think really was in the early 1930s with the introduction of identity cards, and then we just see that starting to continue on. But it's a great question. Yes? Yeah, I think, you know, in those handful of times I'm thinking of people that we just had a hard time connecting with, and I say we because I'm talking about both myself and a translator. 
or people who you probably did feel suffered from some level of pathology that they just couldn't enter into that basic human connection that a conversation involves even with someone you don't know or someone you've just met for the first time. A couple of occasions it was people, and I'm thinking of two Serbs, who just very much loved telling about what they did and embellished on what they did and enjoyed retelling what they did to Bosniaks, Bosnian Muslims. So in those cases, they were people that I would leave the interview with, and maybe some of it was my weakness as an interviewer as well, and I would say, okay, from that one, I, I didn't get any glimpse of, try, of understanding about how they came to do what they did, because from how they presented themselves to me, it looks like they could have been doing this their whole life, and they were just waiting to do this their whole life. That's what I mean when I say that was, there were no points of connection to be made there. And all the other cases of interviews I've done are archives and transcripts and other interviews I've read. In all those cases, you have some sense of being able to track back in a person's identity and think about who they were before this happened and then start to unpack what are the choices they made that led to this. So I think those, that's when I say there's a human connection. That's more what I mean, that I can, I can find that point in the story that I can start to pull together on the pieces of how they came to do what they did. Does that help? Good. All right. I'm going to take one final question from someone who hasn't spoke, and we're going to call it a day. Yeah? You know, every time I say I'm going to take one more question, <laughs> it's always like, God, why did I say I was going to take one more question? <laughs> um, I think we are low at risk. When I, I look in, in the book here, you know, I have four different categories of risk, political, economic, social, and, and um, uh, history. I think for us, if you ask me of those four categories of risk, four is the one, where is the one I see most at threat? It's what we call social cohesion. That societies high at risk for genocide have a high level of social fragmentation. They are divided into us, them, on a lot of different levels. I'm a young guy. I'm in my late 20s. I haven't, I haven't, in my young life, I haven't seen the social fragmentation that seems to surround political and social discourse as it's come these past few years and certainly these past few months. So, I, and I get this often when I travel overseas and I speak to other countries about their own genocidal risk. What they'll say to me is, America looks like it's falling apart socially. You have no cohesion. Some of it they're over-exaggerating and they're, they're falling for other news sources, but a lot of it's absolutely true. So our risk factor I look at is, do we have the social cohesion necessary to survive an economic disaster, a natural disaster, a political upheaval, a military disaster? I mean, do we have that social cohesion? And I think in America we are struggling with things that if I looked at another country, going through what we're going through, I would say there's a pretty high level of social fragmentation there that should be of concern to us. And I think is of concern to a lot of us. We don't think about it in terms of genocide, but as someone who works in genocide studies, I see it as one of those early risk signs that when you have this much social fragmentation, the haves and the have-nots, the lack of, uh, of civility and discourse and all these other things, those things are, are disconcerting and should be disconcerting to us. Again, you could have been in a lot of different places, a lot of different classes this semester. You chose to be here, very proud of you, very hopeful for our future because you're asking questions like this and you're going to be the solution to helping us go through a lot of these problems. So thank you very much. Now we'll turn it back over.